can take enough people to join. <laughs> Percent live yeah. All right, well, welcome everyone. Welcome to the UMass Institute for Holocaust, Genocide, and Memory Studies. My name is John Olson, and I am one of the two acting co directors here. Uh, for the year and as we search for a, uh, a new director. Uh, I want to uh, welcome especially Cal Goldfang and her family who are here. I'd like to uh, welcome Dean Lupe Davidson, uh, Dean of Humanities and Fine Arts, and Vice Chancellor Mike Malone. Thank you for joining us. Also to the board members uh, of the Institute, our academic advisory board members, of course, all of our participants on Zoom, Thank you for taking the time to join us virtually. And lastly, thank you for everyone uh, for attending today's event. Um, we're going to try and go at a rather uh, quick pace. So we've asked our speakers to limit their, their, talk, their um, speaking to three to four minutes. And so don't be surprised if it seems short, but we have many people to get through. And at the end, we'd like to uh, also oh, invite anyone in here or on online to also say some words if they so please. And I think we are beginning with a video of from former Chancellor uh, Humble uh, Sivaswani. So, for this reason, as Chancellor, dear family and friends of Alam and Fino, it gives me comfort and pleasure to participate in this tribute to the profound contributions made by Alam to our university and beyond. When Professor James Young, the founding director of the Institute for Holocaust Memory and Genocide Studies, decided to retire, he left a big vacuum. The Institute has a very public facing profile, and we needed to find a new director who was not only a world-class scholar and teacher, but also a visionary who would engage effectively with the various publics the Institute serves. For this reason, as Chancellor, I paid close attention to this search. We were fortunate to be able to recruit Alon and Fina. Thank you, Tao, for sharing him with us. We quickly set about the task of reaching out to the Institute's various constituents, expanded its scope, and made it a vibrant part of the campus and community again. He made a tremendous impact in the short time he walked with us. On a personal note, I had the pleasure of having conversations with Alon about matters such as anti-Semitism on campus, how to ensure free speech while remaining a welcoming community to all sides of the conflict. He was forthright, thoughtful, and true to his convictions in the face of pressure from interest groups. He did his part to promote civic dialogue. I particularly appreciated his work with the global community of scholars on a more enlightened definition of anti-Semitism in a university context. Alain Fontino, Alev Hassan. My name is Dorothy Berkeley, and I'm a faculty member in the history department at Smith College. It's an honor to speak to you today, even as it feels too early to me to say more than I did in July. And yet I feel too that that sentiment that I tried to convey then remains. So I want to 
return to just some of it here to remember Alon in gratitude. The reasons that Alon became a famous historian are well known. And these are the reasons that I knew his work long before I knew him, long before he came to Amherst and ran the first year long faculty seminar at the Institute in which we read, deliberated and argued together about the global history of 1948. As I came to know him as a person though, he mattered to me not only because of his intrepid and reliable brilliance, but because I learned that he lived the way that he wrote. As a scholar, his moral voice was clarion and meticulous. As his colleague, I saw his defiance of well-worn claims and foundational myths was also a resolute refusal of the reactionary, turning away from conversation or even a fight <laughs> was anathema to him. He demonstrated in his own work and in his leadership what it meant to commit to understanding the relationship between persecuted and persecutors. He did not shy away from the proximities produced by this relationship. Instead, he sought them out and he did not seek to evade the sometimes lacerating specificity of the challenges this presented for him specifically even as he took positions that could be and often were embattled. On principle and in practice, he excluded no one. He was, as our colleague and fellow 1948 seminar participant, Adi Gordon, who's sitting here today, put it of him always including. Him. He was always bringing levity and stamina to our discussions with the particularity of his energy, some wine, and I must mention them again, his excellent red shoes. <laughs> As some of you know, Alon had recently started to publish histories in which he centered his own family of origin. Over several years, we were in a memoir writing group together, made up of a small circle of faculty from multiple countries, grappling on paper with our own origin stories. I believe that members of that group knew Alon in a register, many others did not. I can still see his face as he listened intently to our feedback on his family's story as he wrote it. I saw the gentle tenacity I knew from other conversations, and I also saw profound grief. He wanted to know and produce in his memoir. As he told us, the whole truth, a brazen claim for a historian, yet one he nonetheless pursued, tirelessly adjusting his lens in that pursuit. It was something to watch. Alon always honored his sources in all their contradiction, but in this case, in his own case, he honored his own ancestors in their full complexity. This meant examining the most arcane and even painful evidence, and it also meant vividly describing the wild rosemary he remembered as the fragrance of his Jerusalem childhood, a fragrance that was, as he wrote in a piece for our writing group, quote, his personal madeleine. In one of the last sessions in which he was able to participate, the writing Alon shared was about his grandfather, but I believe at the end of the conversation, it was clear that he wanted to talk and write most what he wanted to talk and write about most and next were the women in the family. I think of this now when I look through the last emails I received from him. I have so many books I still want to write, he told me. We have not only lost a great historian, but a deeply human presence who was also a visionary, whose absence hurts those who knew and loved him beyond anything any of us can say here today and whose absence will also be felt by many who did not know him at all. May his memory be a blessing. Dear family, friends, and colleagues, dear beloved son, long love of life, and protecting angel. Alone was my, my best friend. Not in a sense that he was first among many, but in a special category, category best friends who is integral to one's own life, everyday life. My wife and father called him the lover. In the last years before he fell ill, we, we would speak two or three times a week, sometimes um, across the ocean. I'm on the one side in Jerusalem and he's 
in Amhels. At certain times, we even spoke every day. Alon, I still remember you calling, calling me, me calling you or you calling me, and open with a tone that was a mixture of wonder and sarcasm. I said in Hebrew, it was always in Hebrew, Amos. What's going on with your university? What's going on with your government? <laughs> it's been almost three months since you left us, and I still find myself wanting to share with you, sometimes urgently, several times a day, wanting to consult with you or ask you for something. Sometimes I even take my phone out of my text to text you, only then to remember. Literally. I sit in front of the computer when I wrote it, contemplating what to write about you. What, what can I say in a few minutes to an audience, some of whom I know, and to some I'm a complete stranger? Once again, I need your advice. I think you would tell me, as you many times did, that it doesn't matter what I say, it's important to find the right tone. So, my dear beloved Alon, I hope you think I found the right tone. And uh, I want to serve a very quickly his scholarship, very quickly. So in my opinion, Alon's intellectual biography is also a very personal existential journey that has a clear direction. Alon was born in 1959 and grew up in Talbir, neighborhood of Jerusalem. The poet Shachan Chanikovsky wrote that a person is but a reflection of the landscape of his homeland. And indeed, in many ways, Alon remained a Jerusalem, Jerusalemite until the day he died. I too, by the way, have lived in Jerusalem all my life. However, his intellectual endeavor began far, far away from Jerusalem. He wandered from beloved and despised Jerusalem from Talbia, from Salome Square to Berkeley University on the West Coast. The topic he chose to write about was also distance from, distant from Jerusalem. His doctorate and first two books focused on German nationalism at the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century, he discovered how the shared national Heimat is imagined differently at the local level, allowing for the pres preservation of local identity within the new German national identity. As such, Alon was one of the pioneer cultural historians who engaged with the role of imagination in history, significantly, significantly refining, refining Benedict Anderson's notion of the nation of an imagined community. The question of imagination in history would occupy him throughout his life. However, this was the distant starting point. As a historian of imagination, Alon also engaged with collective memory. And in 1997, he published one of the most influential and important articles in the study of memory and cultural studies at the American Historical Review. The subject of memory brought him closer to addressing issues that occupied him existentially, not just intellectually as a Jew and as Israeli, specifically the Holocaust. In 2012, he published a book, Foundational Past, in which he explored the Holocaust memory as a foundational memory, not only for Jews, but the West, and perhaps even beyond. Following that, Alon delved, delved even deeper into the core of the Jewish and Israeli identity and began to, began to address the Holocaust itself. 2014, he published his book, A World Without Jews. This, this, to my opinion, marked a turning point in Alon's writing because in this book, he no longer focused on how imagination shapes identities and creates group, but rather on how imagination destroys identities and annihilates group. He argued that what enabled the Nazis to exterminate the Jews was the political imagination they created, a world without Jews. In his next project, while based in Amherst, and directing this beloved institute he loved so much. He returned intellectually to Earth Israel, to the land of Israel, Palestine, from which he had departed to Berkeley more than 35 years earlier. He returned to the core of contemporary Israeli and Jewish identity, to the wound, to the foundational wound, I say, to 1948, the year of the establishment of the state and the, and the Palestinian Akbar. At this stage, Alon's writing became much more personal. In his last book, which was published in Hebrew and hopefully will be published very soon in English, Alon deals with Tantua, a Palestinian village on the Mediterranean coast that was conquered by the Israeli army in the summer of 1948 
After the battle, a massacre occurred in the village and all of its inhabitants were expelled. On its room, the kibbutz Machshulim was established. The book tells the story from very personal, his own personal view and many personal voices uh, within the broader context of the 1948 war. Here too, Alo examines, alone examines political imagination and argues that the way Zionist imagination envisioned Israel without Arabs or with as few Arabs as possible is key to understanding the occurrence of the Nakba and what we're what we are experiencing now. He proof, <laughs> he proof added in this book, while connected to numerous tubes in Mass General Hospital in Boston, barely able to speak. He felt that this was his most important book and the book he loved most. The writing of the book of Tantua interrupted his work on a larger book, which unfortunately he didn't have time to finish, focusing on 1948 through the lens of two families. The first was the Sakakini family, who lived in Jerusalem in Katamon neighborhood, 200 meters from where I live today. The second was his own family, the famous Sireni family. Enzo Sireni, alone's grandfather, left Italy and his beloved communist brother Emilio to Palestine, and they parted tragically, for the sake of the Zionist dream and became one of the leaders of the issue. In 1944, Enzo parachuted in Italy, was captured and executed by the Nazis. Enzo Sireni was part of both the Zionist myth and Alon's family myth. Alon's intellectual journey, which began in, began in late 19th century Germany and focused on how myths create group, ultimately led him to led him home to the realization that one must shed wrong myths to look reality in the face as it is. His last piece that he published posthumously was an essay in which in a loving and empathic, <clears throat> in an unbelievably empathically toned deconstruction, deconstructed the national myth and the family's myth surrounding Enzo in Hebrew. Alone, dear friend, beloved friend, as we say in Hebrew, me, God, I found my neighbor who will what? The dust from your eyes, so you can see how much we need your advice now. To free ourselves from the wrong myth that brings ruin upon ruin on us, disaster upon disaster, to start looking at reality beyond the personal, familiar, communal, national myths. I met alone for the first time in a panel he chaired. He had just finished my, I had just finished my doctorate and Alon was already a big name. It was a conference with many esteemed individuals that made a controversial, and I made a controversial and provocative claim also regarding myths. While I was speaking, half the whole applauded and one and one uh, counter arguments were raised against me, the other half of the whole applaud. The atmosphere was tense and I literally almost freaked out. <laughs> Alon was there to calm me down. I really love what you said. It simply stated, making me understand that he fully supported and backed me. Since then, we became friends. And like many others, I continued to lean on him during many difficult moments because Alon was a very strong person, mentally, intellectually, and also physically. He was a fortress. How much we need honest, straightforward, decent, so, so humane, strong people like alone right now. As we say, we are sorry for those who were lost and cannot be found again. Alone? Me and your friend. I miss you day by day, hour by hour. You left us at a very difficult time. May your memory be blessed. <laughs> Right. If you want to unmute yourself and go. 
Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. I met Alon a few years ago at a book event at Columbia University. The event was around a book just published, The Holocaust and the Nakba, that my friends Amos Goldberg and Bashir Bashir have edited. That evening, I mentioned to Amos that we must do something about the new definition of antisemitism just adopted by the IRA. Given that the new definition poses a threat to the possibility of any active solidarity with Palestine and poses a threat to the free speech as well. Both of us saw the risks and the threats in the definition. Amos told me that he was discussing the same issue with Alone just a few days earlier, and that he's very much worried as well. That same evening in December, the three of us met in the lobby of the hotel to discuss the issue and to take some initiative. That in fact is how the whole idea of drafting an alternative definition to the IRA have started. It was my pleasure for the next couple of years to work with Alon in the drafting committee to the GDA, the Jerusalem Declaration. Alon was the leading figure and the guiding spirit. He managed very smoothly to conduct the debates to, for ideas that can bridge differences. And at times when we feel that the project is not progressing as we thought, that we are stuck, he never gave up. He always knew how to find the way to create a consensus with lots of patience and elegance. At one point, I felt that as a Palestinian, I cannot sign the declaration. Alon showed his full understanding and asked me very gently and kindly whether I can continue to advise the drafting group even if I'm not willing to sign it. I agreed, of course, and I'm glad that I did that. Before Alon knew about his illness, he sent me the draft of a paper about Zionism and violence and another draft of his book on Tantura. I read both of them thoroughly. And as the editor of Qadaya, a journal published in Arabic dealing with the Israeli affairs, I decided to translate a chapter of the book and the paper as well to Arabic. I thought that his very sensitive and nuanced voice about the Nakba should be heard and his writing should be read by the Arab audience. I'm glad we managed to do that during his life. It's the case that people like Alon, with his unique voice, understanding, elegance, empathy, who still give us some hope that a conversation between Jewish Israelis and Palestinian is possible. Alon left us when he is mostly needed because we lack the imagination and the vocabulary to conduct such a conversation. I'm sure he could have helped us find the words that can allow the conversation to go on. Alon, dear friend, you are missed very, very much. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Stephen Klingman. Um, I'll be saying a few words about a long day, so but right now it's my privilege, my honor to read uh, from a long from words. Um, it comes from an essay that many people here will know uh, from the book that uh, I must mention, The Holocaust of Nakba, edited by Thomas Goldberg and by Claire Bashir. Uh, it's a piece of all when Gena and Henrik Kowalski challenged history, Jacqueline 1949, between the Holocaust and the Nakba. And it begins with testimony by uh, Genya Kowalski on her experience landing in Israel after the war. And I'll begin with that testimony and then go on to some of Alon's commentary. I'm sure it's familiar to many people here, but I, um, I want to say that I think we can hear Alon's voice 
And I think his approach, which is not to equate the Holocaust and Nakba, neither to negate either of them, but to think about their relationship in the modern history of Israel and Palestine. So let me begin with Genya. We were shaved, we were naked, we did not cry. We did not know what a crematorium is. They lead you inside. We don't know where you're going. They told us, you see, look at the chimney. There was smoke coming out. You're waiting to go inside. I never wanted to tell. In Haifa, we got out of the ship and they took us to Padre's cuts. They were tense and it was a hard winter in 1949. There were heavy rains and it was cold. Our clothes were soaked and we cried. So I decided I'm not standing here. The Jewish agency promised to get us an apartment. We went to them and they gave us a key and we arrived at Jaffa. It was not far from the harbor. It was a house enclosed by a fence. We opened the gate, opened the door and went in. And we couldn't believe our eyes. We were in shock. The house was beautiful, but we didn't even enter the house because in the yard, there was a round table set with plates. And as soon as we saw this, we were frightened. And besides the fear, we could not look. It hurt us. How could people? It reminded us how we had to leave the house and everything behind when the Germans arrived and threw us into the ghetto. And here it was just the same situation, and it was not in us to stay. I did not want to do the same thing that the Germans did. We left, returned the key, and stayed in Natla Jehuda, place near Tel Aviv. And here then is part of Adam's commentary. A conception of human behavior that commingles virtues and vices as complementary, not contradictory, is one important aspect in the acknowledgement of the Nakba by Israeli Jews. What is also the most difficult balancing act of memory to achieve in the present day Israeli Jewish society. Laws of physics posit that two solid objects cannot occupy the same space at the same time. But memories are different. They can and do coexist always. For every side, society has multiple memories of different pasts. The Holocaust and the Nakba reside now side by side in Israeli Jewish society. The Jews use the memory of the former to erase the memory of the latter. As the Holocaust is largely employed, to deny or belittle the Nakba and Jewish responsibility for it. Is it at all possible to maintain a complementary balancing act of, of memory between the two events? The Kowalski's Act poses a challenge to Holocaust history and memory because it is a grand act of restrained rejection of the claims made by Jews in the name of the Holocaust to legitimize injustices towards the Palestinians. Theirs is a vision of history and memory that rejects the zero-sum game of identities and that acknowledges that the world is not divided neatly between victims and perpetrators. To the contrary, at times, victims and perpetrators reside in the same person and in the same group. This vision resists the condition in which the Holocaust achieves an a priori claim over the Jews, their needs, life, morality, visions of the past, and political behavior. It resists the claims made in the name of the Holocaust about the singularity of Jewish suffering, the eternity of Jewish victimhood, and the pristine, immaculate birth of the state of Israel. Their act declares by whispering, not by shouting, the moral obligation of the victim towards other victims particularly towards the victims created by one's own actions, an obligation that the state of Israel has denied with respect to the Palestinians since 1948. Affirmation of such an obligation is deemed in Israeli society as treasonous, if not indeed as Holocaust denial. But acknowledging that Jewish victims of the Holocaust could be perpetrators in 1948 does not diminish the Holocaust just as Jewish victimhood during the Holocaust does not justify the Nakba. Rather, it makes us more and not less human, fallible and vulnerable, as we all are. Good 
Good morning. Uh, my name is Monica Black, and I'm enormously grateful to say that Alon was my PhD advisor at the University of Virginia from 2000 to 2006. I'm really grateful for this chance to have a to, to to have this chance to say a few words to honor my advisor Alon, who I not only admired. and learned so much from, but also loved. Not everyone can say that about their PhD supervisor. <clears throat> Sorry, I met him in the early spring of 2000. The weather in Charlottesville that day was perfect. I remember that very well. The name at Charlottesville did not carry the associations that it does now. I had contacted a lot of professors at a lot of programs but my meeting with Alon was different because he appeared to be genuinely interested in everything I was interested in. And that's why I wanted to work with him because he was interested in everything. It's exciting to be around someone like that. And it was fun. It was fun to be around Alon Confino. No one's quite said that yet, but it's true because Alon was funny. And he was also extremely generous in conversation and in other ways. He was extremely generous about inviting graduate students into his circle. He changed my life in that way and in many others. Alon Campino was a cultural historian. He was not interested in correcting what people in the past got wrong. He was interested in understanding what could be learned from how wrong they got it. He saw value in the incompleteness and impermanence of our understandings of the past. He saw that truth came in a lot of flavors, some of them toothsome, some bland, some completely unpalatable. He was interested in the meaning of things, in all of their glory and horror. Alon liked the past for its mystique and allure, two words he really favored. And he liked the past for its inherent intangibility, I think, the way that it always ultimately eludes us. He loved its mystery, as he so often wrote. He loved its strangeness. These were also concepts he, he favored a great deal. Alon liked plurality and the wild and barely explicable unfolding of change. He liked, in his own words, the infinite diversity of things. Alon really loved history and he loved being a historian. That much is clear to anyone who knew him. But what he loved even more, I think, was life. History was a way of engaging his passion for life. Love for life and the living and the once living was the wellspring, I think, of his whole creative endeavor as a historian. Because Alon Convina was not just a historian. For him, history provided a creative outlet, dare I say, an art form for exploring life in all the mind boggling and sublime and terrifying forms it takes. His generosity, his spirit of openness, his incredible creativity, his hilarious way with words, his gestural repertoire, his big, easy laugh, and as Darcy said, his wonderful taste in shoes. I will remember all of these things, and I will miss them, and I will miss him. Thank you. My name is Brian Clug, and I'm joining this memorial event for Alon from Horns, London. I knew Alon only for the last three or four years of his life. To know him was to want to know him more, to enjoy his geniality, and his generosity of spirit. He was such a vivid person that looking back, I find it hard to believe that we never met in actual reality, only virtual. We met on Zoom. What brought us together, though it sounds weird, was anti-Semitism. He and Amos, Raif and I, were part of a small group that over several months drafted the JDA, the Jerusalem Declaration on Anti-Semitism. What Alon contributed to the project 
was priceless. There was, of course, his insight, his sound judgment, the clarity of his mind, all those qualities that are the hallmark of his scholarship. But there was something else as well as his mind. Call it heart. He put his heart into it, and the warmth of his personality filled the virtual room. Now, as a rule, academics are not terribly good at reaching a consensus about a text that they are writing together. And as collegial as our group was, we were no exception to the rule. It got to the point where someone had to pull the threads of the discussion together and produce a coherent text. Alon and I were deputed by the group to do this. I don't recall co-authoring anything else in my career. I don't have the temperament. But Alon had enough temperament for both of us. Amos tells me that Alon was, quote, extremely proud of the JDA. I am extremely grateful to have had the opportunity to work with Alon in a twosome and in a sixome. It was, to put it simply, a delight. But it wasn't only the JDA that brought Alon and I together. Academia.edu did too. Via the website, I received a link to one of his articles on Zionism, which led us to exchange writings. Alon and I did not come from the same place, neither literally nor in any other sense. He grew up Jewish in Israel. I grew up Jewish in Northwest London. As a historian, his work had its roots in scrupulous research into the past. Mine, as a philosopher, had no roots at all. But as I told him in an email, I found his work on Palestine and Israel refreshingly inclusive. We discovered an underlying affinity in how we saw the issues. But we discovered this too late. The conversation on email that we began was nipped in the bud by his fatal illness. And I feel selfishly that something precious was taken from me. There was something else that he and I shared, something that might be a revelation to many people here, however well they knew him. Monica said Alon was interested in everything, and this included British football, or to translate into American English, soccer. He was a fan, a fervent fan of Arsenal. Arsenal is the club that, along with Jewishness, lies at the heart of my Northwest London identity. The fortunes of the club became a staple of our correspondence. And in an email I sent him last year, I said that if he ever pays a visit to Blighty, I could offer him a ticket for a game and we could go together. He wrote back, wonderful idea about Arsenal. The offer still stands. Good morning. It's a it's a real privilege to be here. I'd like to thank the organizers and Alon's family for the um, uh, allocating me just a few minutes to talk about um, my own experience as a university administrator working with Alon. Uh, I had the privilege of working with former Chancellor Subhaswamy and Dean Julie Hayes to attract Alon to us in Amherst as director of this institute. Uh, at that time, the institute was about six years old and had gone through a lot of growth under the founding director, James Young, and also some growing pains uh, at the time, uh, as is common in any new venture. Uh, I was quite concerned about finding a new director uh, for the institute because this and other institutes are so such an important part of our scholarship here at the university, especially interdisciplinary work, uh, where Alon really uh, showed the way. Um, I recall meeting Alon for the first time uh, during his interview, and I, I uh, couldn't have been more excited and honestly relieved to hear his vision for the institute. Uh, I had a list of questions to ask during the meeting, and I started by asking Alon what it was about UMass and the Institute that interested him. 
I was so impressed and excited about his thinking, I never asked the rest of the questions. <laughs> Uh, in fact, by the end of the meeting, I wasn't quite sure who was being interviewed. <laughs> uh, Alan exceeded all my expectations as institute director. I was especially impressed by the way he continued and expanded the work in the institute during the pandemic. Uh, he was so diligent about letting us know about all the activities and connections the institute developed and maintained. Uh, we're committed to seeing this continue here in Amherst and part of Alan's role live on in the Institute. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, determined to see this. Uh, Alan was always very generous with his time, as many people have said, uh, especially for issues at the university where his expertise and accomplishments could have formed and enriched the conversation. He was especially thoughtful and effective in difficult conversations that we've already heard, and we do very much miss him, especially this last year. Uh, UMass Amherst and the Institute are better places on account of his contribution. And on behalf of the university, our very heartfelt thanks to Alon, to all of you participating today, and especially to Alon's family. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to say a few words about it. I'm Luke Pino. I'm Julie Hayes, former Dean of the College of Humanities and Fine Arts. And as Mike said, I was one of those who played a role in bringing along the end of Paul to UMass. Um, I have little to add to what others have said about Alon's capacity for love, friendship, intellect, his tireless search to understand and articulate some of the most intractable problems of our time. I miss all of those parts of him. And I deeply regret that the world has lost his voice at a time when it is most needed. So the only observation that I think I can add or perspective I can add is to recall the significance which Mike has also alluded to um, the, of his task in assuming the directorship of IHGMS. I mean, in some ways, it might not seem so difficult. I mean, there had been ups and downs, but the founding director, James Young, had worked long and hard to lead the institute with a permanent home, here we are, and in sound financial shape. But it is no easy task to come into an organization that has been marked by a visionary founder, even one as gracious and generous as James. Alan immediately set to work, building on that strong foundation of scholarship and outreach, expanding the Institute's programming and institutional connections, and furthering its mission, expanding its mission as a locus, I course, quoting the mission, a locus for research and teaching on Holocaust, genocides, and events of mass violence, as well as on the memory and representation of these historical circumstances, occurrences. His success in leading the Institute through its first succession transition is a model of how such <clears throat> infinitely delicate transitions can be managed with understanding and respect for the past and an exceptional capacious vision of the future. The Institute and the university are the stronger because of this. Apologize. Do you want to say? Do you want to introduce? The, you must do you want to say what yeah. this case is? This is a song that I long loved 
most, and it's about to uh, a couple of both of the brothers from Thessaloniki coming to Palestine. <laughs>
Applause is not for me. Not for me. Yeah, give, me, give me just one second. I'm David Metnikoff, um, the other uh, acting co director <laughs> of the Institute, a specialist in Middle Eastern politics and, and law, and chair of one of Alon's academic units, the Department <laughs> of Judaic and Near Eastern Studies, where Alon was an essential and irreplaceable colleague. We focus typically on Alon's role as this institute's director, but he had another title the Pentishka Professor, the professor of what it means not to forget. Now, I am no scholar of memory, but I was inspired by Alon's approach to how not to forget a global tragedy connected to one's identity, whether this is the Holocaust or the more recent focus of Alon's scholarly depth and integrity, the massive physical and emotional disruption to Palestinians wrought by Israel's independence in 1948. You see, Alan, particularly in his years at UMass, modeled not forgetting about global humanitarian tragedy, as we have heard earlier, by seeing it through the eyes of a wide range of witnesses, even when this implicated negatively his own people or family. Amidst the acts of massive human cruelty that happen during times of divisive conflict, it is easy to compartmentalize, dig into one's own group affinity, and commemorate events in terms that reaffirm a sense that rightness and truth are mostly on one's own side. But this is usually selective and ultimately self-serving memory. A lot asserted and taught by his example that meaningful historical memory comes from casting aside intentionally our own temptations to favor narratives that privilege ethically people with whom we identify. Alon did not forget that Israel's independence also meant Nakba or calamity for Palestinians. This meant documenting the death of 1948's human upheaval so that he could portray as the French 19th century novelist Stendhal, apologies to Julie, saw in his most famous work, The Red and the Black, La Verité, La Préverité, The Truth, The Bitter Truth. Alain's interventions were especially powerful because his expertise allowed him to work productively in a very contested space about what we mean by not forgetting in the context of the Holocaust. Does not forgetting mean commemorating the Holocaust as a unique instance of state-sponsored genocide, leading us to focus our gaze mainly on the ongoing scourge of anti-Semitism? Or does Pentishkach entail recognizing and, combat and combating the conditions and occurrences of genocide, no matter who the perpetrator and victims might be? For a lot, the answer was not either or, but both and. A lot's practice of confronting boldly even the most personally unsettling aspects of historical commemoration also extended to his other work on our campus, as you've heard. He taught in a manner that invited students to question their preconceived ideas and affinities. This was powerful, even transformational. He championed the need for people to engage in difficult conversations, even when this challenged deep personal affinities. Yet, Alon was neither loud nor striped. I observed him using an unusual combination of calm calculation and care. In a less hyperbolic way than the comedian Larry David, Alon would scrutinize you and size you up, as he did with me. If you seemed open to his ethos, he would let you into his world again, as he did with me. But even if he didn't take you into the risky orbit of collaborating with him, he would show you kindness and never openly dismiss you or your ideas. In short, Alon Campina was uniquely well suited to be our university's Pentishkach professor, our learned teacher of not forgetting the Holocaust and genocide. We too, in turn, cannot and do not wish to forget Alon. For this reason, I am grateful to announce that starting next year, the Institute will sponsor an annual Alain Campino Memorial Lecture. We host each year's Campino Lecture 
which will be inaugurated by Amos Goldberg, will display the spirit of Alon's gifts, even if nothing could possibly replace continuing to have my friend's example and erudition still among us. Thank you. So I am not an expert on the Middle East, as many of you know, and despite my name, I'm so not an expert on the Middle East. I know almost nothing. Um, so I think I'm here as really as an example of Alon's warmth and inclusion, which we've been hearing so much about and which is absolutely true. Um, I plan to spend the rest of my life learning to live by two principles that Alon taught me. First, when facing a painful or controversial issue, don't shy away and don't shut it down. Have the conversation. And second, reach out with empathy. This is a word we've been hearing a lot today for the reason my colleague in the history department, Andy Johnson, chose to express Alon's gift in this way as well when he shared um, an anecdote that I thought I should include. Um, he recalls that at Alon's job interview, and he challenged Alon's interpretation on Rafa Kristallnacht, and Alon, quote, smiled, winked, and nodded giving all the reasons to favor my opposing position. Then he said kindly, I disagree with you. <laughs> <laughs> I first met Alon because he came to my office to introduce himself. It was after hours and I was filling time waiting to attend an evening event on Palestine. Given family responsibilities, I might not even have been going if I hadn't stuck my neck out about the event and experienced some uncomfortable blowback. And I was feeling overwhelmed and vulnerable and wishing I was on my way home already. Um, but though he had never met me, Alon must have guessed that this was the case. And so he came to find me in my office um, and introduce himself. He put me immediately at ease. He didn't make me feel I was trespassing in territory I had no business talking about. Rather, he welcomed my thoughts, uh, no matter how many gaps there were in my understanding, which there were many. Um, he and I went to dinner and then to the event where he sat with me. Um, and it was, of course, a privilege to be sitting next to someone who could offer insightful comments on the content. But beyond that, it was such a gift to have a woman you know, choosing to sit with me in that moment when I was feeling out of place and out of my depth. A year or so later, Alon and I put together a panel we called Modern Nightmares for the Feinberg series, which that year was called Another World is Possible, Revolutionary Visions Past and Present. The panel was a risky endeavor. We juxtaposed right-wing and left-wing efforts to purge society of unwanted ideas and people. And the inspiration, of course, was Alon's work in the world without Jews his willingness to get into the heads of Nazis to fathom how their violent imagination came to make sense to a large number of people. It seemed to me a kind of demand that anyone who has a big vision for a future world scrutinize that vision very carefully. And his steadfast commitment to having the conversation, even if it's scary or touches painful spots in our own lives or minds, pushed me to take a risk I might not otherwise have taken asking of leftist movements that I feel close to what role purging of ideas or sometimes purging of people has played. So empathy leads us to more critical understanding, including of ourselves. And this is a powerful lesson I owe to Alon. Finally, and in the end, most important, Alon introduced me to talk and encouraged her to spend time with me during the last year of his life when she could spare a few hours from her caregiving. <laughs> My world has been immeasurably expanded through the time I have spent with Tal. As I stared with her into the abyss that his loss represents, I'm devastated for all of us, but most of all for her. And I am grateful to you alone forever for sharing her with me. You
knowing that someone who affected everybody he knew very deeply, as we've been able to tell today. Again, my name is Stephen Klingman. I uh, recently retired from the English Department. And that's sort of the theme that I'll pursue today. Alon Confino affected me deeply, profoundly. He did so not only because of what he said and did, but because of the way he was, how he went about being in the world. I want to stress, I'm not in Alon's scholarly fields, he wasn't in mine. I've never written on the Holocaust, German history, Israel, Palestine, anti-Semitism, complications of Zionism. Yes, we were both Jewish, but he was from Israel, I from South Africa. Our lives, our life experiences were so different. Yet that was the point. It was precisely because of the differences, as much as the crossovers, that we had much to talk about. This was a profound commitment of our minds to learn from difference, even as one brought one's full self to the encounter. That, at base, I believe, was what turned him so deeply to the entanglements of Israel Palestine. He wanted to face the truth wherever and whatever it was. And for him, truth and justice were intertwined. With a commitment that was ethical, bodily, intellectual, combined with a spirit of perpetual exploration. His outlook was large, expansive, as well as focused. He was there in everything he did. And somehow he managed to do it with a buoyant touch, a smile, a sense of irony and humor, and levels of insight and clarity that you have. He got to the heart of matters. We engaged in things together. Some years ago, when there was a large pro-Palestinian event planned on campus, with much tumult and opposition in advance, at Alon's initiative, the two of us wrote an open letter saying the event should go ahead. This is what universities are for, we argued. The venues for, to use one of Alon's favorite terms, difficult conversations. Later, Alon brought me and others, such as David Mednikov, onto the planning group that developed the Jerusalem Declaration on Anti-Semitism that Brian has spoken about today. I told him, Alon, this is not my territory. I'm from South Africa. That's why I want you to see. As always for Alon, it was voices from outside the encampment that could provide key perspectives, not only those from inside. South Africa had a history of colonial and apartheid rule, struggle for freedom, a resolution of seemingly intractable identitarian politics, a vision of liberation that applied to all, not just to some. As much as I learned from alone, it meant a huge amount to me that my world had something to offer in his. All this sounds scholarly and intellectual, and it is, but again, I want to stress Alon's effect on me was profoundly personal. We took walks together at the Renaissance Center with his and Tal's beloved dog, Flesher, discussing the campus and the world, life, the universe, and everything. We exchanged writing. We watched soccer together at my house, Brian. Both of us Arsenal fans. If we could have joined you, we would have loved to do that. My wife, Moira, and I enjoyed a wonderful Passover Seder at Tal and Alone's together with all their children. The sparkling, irreverent, the kind of evening that leaves you energized and enlivened. I look forward to years of friendship with Alon, to conversations that would go on and on. After his treatment began in Boston, I visited him there. We had lunch outside at a cafe, and he was himself. More serious, perhaps, but still with his spirit intact. After October the 7th in Gaza, I was desperate to speak with him, to get his views, his perspectives, his guidance, but that was not to be. Towards the end, in what was about the last week of his life, I felt blessed to be able to see him one last time mm -hmm. at his house. We sat outside and couldn't speak for long. He wasn't up to it. We discussed the Institute, and also himself. It was too soon, he said to me, too soon. In such moments, one is able to say important things. I told him how much he had meant to me. I told him he would always be in my life. I believe that is true. It was a friendship of too few years, and I miss him enormously. 
and Alon will always be in my life. There is something about his clarity, his brightness, his courage, his outlook that I hope will be with me all the way. Thank you to our speakers. And now we'd like to invite uh, anyone else in the room who'd like to come and give voice to Alon's memory and his contribution to his life. If not, then um, we'll say, um, sorry, is there anyone on Zoom? We can't. We can't, oh, okay, because of the webinar format. I see, okay. Well, we thank you once again for, for coming to celebrate the memory of our dear colleague, um, Confino, um, and we will uh, give us like five minutes for those who are, are here. We do have lots of food to share with you. Please stay and um, share your stories of, of the line. Thank you very much. Um, for the speakers, we can maybe take a couple of pictures before we have some questions. Sure.